nutritionist Mark O'Shea. Where, where, where? And I'm on the trail of a snake that spits venom. Oh, nice one, nice one. An African spitting cobra. My quest will take me through the eye of a firestorm and into the jaws of Africa's spitting cats. One clear shot at the eyes is all the spitting cobra needs, and I'm putting myself in the firing line. This one's up for it. At first glance, it's just a drab brown snake. Then, the spitting cobra opens its mouth and fires twin jets of venom into the eyes of its victims. It burns like hot needles and can cause blindness. But spitters also bite, causing flesh to putrefy and die. This much we know about spitting cobras but discovering more about their unique firepower could provide a breakthrough in the treatment of snake bite. Ooh. This is a Mozambique spitting cobra. This fellow you can see is really up for it. He's spat at me a number of times. That's why I'm wearing safety goggles. Whereas another snake, using venom for defense would have to bite you. These fellas can defend themselves with their venom from up to eight feet away and spit up to 50 times. Spitting cobras are specialists, highly evolved snakes that don't just bite. They can actually project their venom. But there's something else special about spitters. They could hold the key to safer snake bite treatment. If you're bitten by a snake, it's impossible to gauge how much venom the snake has injected into you, which makes the treatment more difficult. I'm in South Africa to team up with Bruce Young from Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, who's trying to solve this mystery. Bruce believes spitting cobras are the key to knowing how much venom a bite victim has received. Because they're the only snakes to spit venom, they present a unique chance to measure the amount of venom produced. So Bruce's research could ultimately save lives. This will serve very nicely as a field laboratory for Bruce's experiments. All we need now are some spitters. My quest is to collect wild, fully armed Mozambique spitting cobras for Bruce's research. But I'll be needing the help of a local, my old buddy Donald Stradham, who's often called to remove dangerous snakes from people's homes. The spitter eats anything, Mark. You know, well, you find them right through the year, really. I mean, they'll even eat other snakes. So you think we should find some? I think it's a good chance. To confront the spitter, we'll journey to the heart of KwaZulu-Natal, the cradle of the Zulu nation. We start by putting the word out in the local villages. Gently, gently. We can't take a spitter into a classroom, but a non-venomous python really helps get the kids on the case. We call this a Southern African python, but I'm sure in Zulu you have another name for it. Nkwati. Nkwati. Is that right? But we're actually looking for another snake, Mfezi. Do you know Mfezi? Yes. The spitting cobra. Now that snake is dangerous. Has anybody seen Mfezi?
bitters live cheek by jowl with people. I always wanted to kick a wall down. Invading houses on the lookout for their prey. Rodents. What's your house knocking down? You know, it's a call. Where? Where? Can you see it? They've gone inside. So these fellas saw it go in. It's quite a big snake. Sounds like a cobra. The workers are clearing this site to build offices and the snake has disappeared under a massive mound of rubble. A lot of manpower uh, to find a snake, but uh, it could be well worth it. I think this is the ethological equivalent of taking a sledgehammer to crack an egg. Somehow, I think this fella's given us the slip. Local contacts have begun to pay off. They've provided Bruce with some snakes to begin his work. But he needs more, and our search goes on. This sugar cane is just so dense and so tall, you'd be completely lost in here. And it's full of wildlife. Lots of snakes and bush pigs, which will disembowel you. This must be what it's like for an ant on your lawn. The big sugarcane plantations are burning the fields before harvesting. It's a fast burn which destroys the unwanted vegetation, but leaves the cane stalks undamaged. I'm here to look for spitters driven out by the flames. Any snakes in here have got two options, down a hole, or flee in front of the fire. It's a race against time to get out of here, across the path and into the bush beyond. Needs to be ahead of the fire, not behind it. The fire's already been through here. Well, it's up there, listen to it. It's a controlled fast burn, but it's still dangerous. If the wind changes, we could find ourselves trapped. Then we're not going to be able to get into no, the area. Yeah, but we, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Coming through here now. Do I just spread out there and watch this wall? Come, there's a toad. Oh yeah, there we go. I mean, coming out. That's a start. Got him. Toad, yeah. So the animals are beginning to come out. Is he okay, Mark? I'm bent. Yeah, he's fine. He's ahead of the fire. We'll right. kill him. Yeah. Whilst it's an opportunity for us to maybe catch some spitters, I have to say that I'm absolutely certain that things are perishing here, which is really sad. You know, what's a tortoise going to do? It's no longer safe to stay inside the sugar cane. We fall back to a dirt track, but then we're hit by a 12-foot high wall of flames and forced to retreat again. My God, now I know what it's like to get caught in there and have to run ahead of it. That, you felt like you were just going to spontaneously combust then. It was just so hot. It's the start of their winter, but I wasn't prepared for this. Locals call it Zululand snow. Snakes running ahead of the fire at that speed are going to survive. Simple fact that that, that heat is so intense that, that they can be some distance ahead of the flames, and the heat's going to just knock them out. When it comes like that, it's like a, a living, breathing animal. It'll just consume anything in its path. And look how quickly it disappears again. It's gone. It's gone. The intensity of the fire probably killed our chances of finding a spitter. Bala. So we need to widen the search. Uh, can you see the snake? It's under the bed. OK, so just keep an eye on it the whole time, if you can. OK, then. Bye-bye. All right. Um, what are the options? Do what are the options? He says to spitting cobra, but everybody says said, what they want to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah OK. Yeah, no. um, um, it didn't spread a hood. He didn't see the head. The skin is shiny. He says it may have patterns. It may not have patterns. He's not sure. Could be a spitter. Hey, Albert. Snake 
It's around the corner here. In the hair, is it? Alright. Alright. Right. What did you say? Um, it's we saw it just now. It's under under that bed. Yeah. Good, so it's still here. <laughs> well just in case it is a, a spit of dung, put the side, sorry. glasses on. Two state moving and it's yeah. not very big and it could be a it looks like a nice and big. Cool. Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, that's a forest. It's a forest. Yeah. The forest cobra is Africa's longest cobra. It's that, isn't it? Oh, that's a pinning area. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna pin him on the floor where it's playing. Mm -hmm. they they're strong, they're strong snakes. I know. You feel that, eh? The West African ones are mm. they're not bulldogs. That's it. But as for Bruce's uh, experiments. It's going to wait a long time for this one to uh, do anything. Yeah. As soon as it's the main non-spitting cobra down here. Another call out. This time children are at risk from a snake spotted in their father's workshop. Yeah. Oh, wow. We strike yeah. gold. It's a oh, spitter. Yes. Young in. I'll let him run through and yeah. grab it from down here. Not spitting much, eh? Not yet. Mm. There we are. Well, that's what we're after. It's a juvenile, well, youngster. So we'll bag him up, eh? Mm. A fresh and feisty spitter. Just what Bruce needs. Okay. Hang on. Whoa, What's yes. That? Spitting? Just look, just, look oh. you bit through the sack oh, and wow. spat yeah. at my leg. It may be small, but it can spit. Before, actually. <laughs> it's always nice to get the first one for the programme. But there's a snag. We will be the Cobra's targets. <laughs> OK, let's go. <laughs> let's have a look if you guys have got any cuts on you, any shaving cuts, pimples. <laughs> Come on, right there. Yeah. I've got a little scratch on my hand. We should probably yeah. cover up. Yeah, we could cover that up. The spitting Cobras are going to be aiming for the eyes, but, of course, the venom could land on the skin or enter the mouth. And if you've got mouth ulcers or a cut on the hand or a cut on your face, there is a danger you could absorb some of the venom and you might feel the ill effects. Usually, though, the saliva in your mouth will break the venom down quite quickly. Well, that's very important to have some good eye protection. Absolutely. Mm. What he's trying to do is stop you in your tracks so he can get away. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a purely defensive thing. Absolutely effective. I mean, it's I've seen a, a grown man, a game ranger, spat in the eyes as painful as anything. This guy was crying for two days. He carried on phoning me twice a day, saying, you know, my eyes are falling out, they're burning. And That's he so suffered. Crazy. I mean, instinctively, somebody makes you make a plan. You'd wash it out with something. But what would happen if you get this venom in your eyes and you don't wash it out? I've no. come across several people being permanently blinded by it. I know from personal experience that venom in the eye is bad enough. But when the spitter bites, it creates immense human misery. This regional hospital has a catchment area of up to two million people, and every year they see hundreds of snake bite victims. Bites from fearsome snakes like black mamba, forest cobra, and puff adder. But the most common of all is Mfezi, the Mozambique spitting cobra. The Mozambique spitting cover is our main workload in terms of surgery. Dr. Paul Rollinson probably treats more spitter bites than anyone else in southern Africa. This year in particular, we've had our worst year. I've been here 13 years. It's been our worst year by a factor of four. Really? And we've been doing five, six, seven cases a week. Mfezi goes out hunting at dusk. More than half the snake bites occur within two hours of sunset. Children are often sleeping on the floor at the most dangerous time. This is a young lady who we just got back uh, 
for review, just over two months uh, since she was bitten. Very typical Mozambique spitting cobra bite. Presumably the, the treat, one of the treatments would be to actually take away all the dead tissue. Yeah. Spitting cobra venom is a wicked cocktail of different toxins. But the most corrosive is a cytotoxin, which, if you're bitten, destroys human tissue. You guys ready? Aye. Absolutely. <laughs> well, what we need to do is try to capture the spit in the center of these perspex sheets, if we can. Yeah. And ideally, we want to have the perspex sheet about 40 centimeters away from the head of the cobra. But using ourselves as the target. Exactly. We need the snake's we venom. Safety. We have to be careful not to get bitten. He's looking, flicking his tongue. Whoops, it's about to get right, me. Let's attract his attention. Okay. He's opening his mouth slightly. Yeah. He's certainly thinking about yeah. it. <laughs> what do you call this dance, Bruce? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you got it. Oh, nice, nice right. pattern. Look at nice. that right, beautiful right, right. pattern. Yeah. Go on then. Can I have one as well? Go, on, Mark. <laughs> there we go. Yes, got I got that one. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you see the pattern from both the right and the left fang. Oh, sorry. Yes. Anyway, Watch yourself, it. Mark. You're getting in range there. This is the yeah. most efficient oh, way to collect and measure the venom. Then Bruce can discover if the snakes spit a consistent well. amount. Oh, God. This one's up for it. Yes. Mm. Yes, mm. two. <laughs> He's got plenty left. If we get any closer, we'll be kissing. You know that, don't you? <laughs> there he is. Look at that. That's the entire perspex. Yeah, it's mm. my boy. But he obviously oh, doesn't like Bruce. Bruce. Do yes, like he him. does not like Bruce. This is, <laughs> this is a snake with extreme taste. Fine taste. Yes. Oh. These snakes have copious amounts of venom and can spit dozens yeah. of times. <laughs> I didn't okay. get close. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Close range. That was close range, yes. I think let's get the snake You're back right? into a bag, yeah. Yep, that's all over my goggles. Yeah. That's why you wear goggles. Oh, do you want to wash off there? Yes, please. I'll come around as well. That last one got a good coating on my face. Yeah. Keep I can feel it just on, on my left cheek and on oh. the forehead. It's very sticky. It mm, dries almost yeah. immediately. It tastes rusty. If, you, if you're ever talking and, you, and one spits straight into your face and, and it, it hits you back of your throat and yeah. it's... Ah, but and I'd still rather ah. take a blast in the mouth than up the nose. Up the nose, it's very it's difficult so to painful. deal with it. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's yes, hard to rinse out. <laughs> <laughs> you stand on your head and pour water up your nose. <laughs> yes, that's most unpleasant. Natal has incredibly rich mammal life, which is why tourists come here. But some creatures can become problem animals, just like snakes. Elephants that trample crops, or in this case, a cheetah that's been killing cattle for her cub. Mother and a daughter. Yeah. And what age is that? Like? Um, the mother is approximately five to six years, mm -hmm. and the daughter is 18 months to two years. The cheetahs were relocated to this game reserve. It's taken six months of captivity here for them to readjust. They've earned their freedom, and I'm helping biologist Kirsten Cantor to release them. So that's the youngster? Yes, and the mom's on the right. That's why, because she, I mean, the youngster looks the larger of the two. You see that mane? Is that uh, a sign of being ju juvenile? Yes. So when they get older and wiser... <laughs> they lose their hair. <laughs> they lose their hair. That was to us all, I think, doesn't it? <laughs> their nerves are getting the better of their appetite. <laughs> After months of captivity, the cheetahs are very wary of crossing the threshold to freedom. At least they're interested. <laughs> they're very interested. Move forward a little. Forward, forward, forward. Okay, stop. Okay, go forward. Go forward. Come on, girls. Go forward. <laughs> it's just close. 
It's quiet now. I think. Are you all right? Mm -hmm. The daughter falls on the meat, but the mother is much more anxious. Here comes Mum. Well done. That's the game. OK, girls. Cheetahs need to kill every three to five days, but will the young daughter be able to fend for herself? Well, of course, when they're out now, there's oh, no going funny. back. Yeah. I've got to say, it's never taken me so long to tempt two girls to come out for a meal, but now that they're out, there's no going back. And hopefully, within a week, they'll be hunting and killing for themselves. <laughs> Mum's gone. Oh, that's lovely. That must be a fantastic moment for you. Oh, hey? absolutely. It's lovely to see them in a while. Let's just hope they can do it for themselves. Yes, well, I'm sure they will. Yeah. It's necessity is the mother of invention. And if that means learning to hunt, <laughs> so be it. Yeah. That's excellent. There is no greater gift that you can give and freedom. And that is just a wonderful sight. Workers digging an irrigation trench have spotted a venomous snake. Oh ho! Fofada! And it is venomous. Very venomous. They call it puff adder because of the noise they make. Whereas spitting cobras will spit venom, the puff adder inflates its body and then when it exhales, if you ignore the puffing of the puff adder, that's at your peril because then he will bite you and he will bite you with these and he will inject venom. But that does mean that he's got to get right up close to you to bite you. Of course, that's not the way the spitting cobra operates. The spitter's fangs have evolved differently. They can project venom up to eight feet, a remarkable achievement for a four-foot snake. But how do they do it? So what you can see here is I took the fang from a non-spitting and a spitting cobra. Yeah, there's a marked difference, isn't there? Absolutely. And then just kind of for fun, I made these model fangs based on this picture. So that's, uh, that's your normal fang. Right. And if you open that up, you can see the venom canal running down the fang, and it essentially just opens up to the surface to mm, create mm. that exit orifice. Just empties. Right. Okay. In the spitting cobra fang, the yeah. exit orifice is much smaller and the other real big difference is inside, the venom canal runs almost straight down and it takes essentially a 90 degree bend to the exit orifice. So I'll be the regular non-spitting cobra and see if I can project venom forwards. Not very well. Not very impressive, no. no. But this is the spitting cobra. Much better. Good shot. <laughs> yeah. The gaboon is my favorite viper. It's the snake with the longest fangs in the world. And now I've got the chance to release a pair of gaboon vipers on the Natal coastline. Baboons can only be released in remote forests where they occur naturally. And the best place to stay is with the military. This is where the army trains for jungle warfare. I can 
to the pub from here. Ask, and you'll be given. Charge at me, and you bloody won't. Wait. There's a platoon of semi-trained mammals on parade at the army base. Like these warthogs. This is a kind of animal that you just feel that the creator must have had a hangover when he created him. Either that for a sense of humour, because they are god awful ugly. This time I am the best looking. How many is it we're releasing? Two, two males. The Gaboon Vipers are ready for release. These rare snakes are protected. Barry Stander runs a successful breeding and release project. Why do you reckon this is a good spot then, Barry? This is it, right, only because it's a grassland, tropical forest, and there's not a lot of movements like humans and vehicles. So it's away from threats from collectors or people who to just kill them out of ignorance? That's correct, yeah. Can we have a look at the fellas? Oh, beautiful. Oh, listen to that. Beautiful sound. <laughs> That's a war. It's supposed to be a warning, but I think it's gorgeous. We're in South Africa to look at spitting cobras, a snake with a unique venom delivery system. But this gaboon viper also has quite a spectacular way of dealing with its prey. I could open this gaboon viper's mouth and show you the fangs, but seeing as we're about to release these snakes, we want to stress them as little as possible. So here is a fang which has been shed naturally, and as the snake strikes, it comes forward like that. It delivers venom deep into the prey, a massive dose, possibly penetrating organs. It's like being stabbed with a couple of knives, not just once, but often da -da 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 -da, repeatedly. OK, Barry, this is where you say goodbye to your charge. Go back where they belong. Uh, yeah. There we are. There you go, fella. Nice, cool forest there for you. Job done. We're ready to leave when suddenly we get a call. There's a snake on the base. Let's hope it's a spitter. Ah, oh, that's a nice handy pile of logs. It's inside there. Yeah. Oh, All right, in those blocks. Yeah, in here, so. Yeah. Oh, it's a. Oh, fantastic. It's a, it's a file snake. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, it's the first one of these I've ever caught. This is really fantastic. Look at that. Well, these I don't need. That's cool. This is one of the very few snakes that in cross section is actually triangular. Just look at that raised backbone. Beautiful animals. They are. Look, look at those scales. It's rough. It's like one of those triangular files that you, you, you have for, for sharpening tools. They feed on other snakes and they will even take venomous snakes. They are themselves perfectly harmless. Of course, if there'd been a spitting cobra under this log pile as well, if it came to who eats who, there'd be a spitting cobra inside him. So you can see quite clearly the venom put out by the left and the right fangs. While we've been looking for more spitters, Bruce has been processing the results so far. He's taken digital photos of the venom patterns on the perspex sheets. The next step will be to discover if the amount of venom spat is consistent. join Bruce, we drive to the heart of Zululand. Zulus 
have a powerful warrior history. 100 years ago, they took on the colonial might of the British Empire and won the first battle. Although the Zulus lost the war, over 2,000 men died on the British side. To those men, this must have seemed a hostile land, and the Zulus a fierce and warlike people. It still feels a thrilling and alien place when you're on your way to meet a Zulu traditional healer, Sangorma, who uses deadly snakes in bizarre rituals. The first thing we see is a spitting cobra. Sangorma uses venomous snakes in healing rituals. He says his power over snakes was passed on to him by his ancestors. These snakes are hot. They do have venom glands and fangs, quite obviously from the way he's working the spitting cobra, which has spat at him a couple of times. And, and the fact that he is wary of getting a bite, he knows they're venomous. Sangorma puts the spitter inside his mouth to demonstrate his power. These snakes are highly dangerous, but it's still hard for Donald and I to revere rituals that involve cruelty to animals. He's brutalizing them into submission, and I have this urge to gather up all four snakes and take them and drop them in the bush, because I just think this is quite brutal. <laughs> I'm sad to leave the spitter and the puff adders to their fate, but after an hour of this, Donald and I have had enough. I prefer to see my snakes proud, not cowed. It's pretty clear that spitting cobras have evolved a, a venom for defense. The only snake. One other aspect of the spitting and cobra's repertoire fascinates us. Its accuracy when it spits. But does it actually but target the eyes? Know? I've just seen many times where you'd approach a Mozambique spinning cobra and I would move my hand to let it see this, using a lot of movement to distract the snake. Yeah. And it spat constantly at my hand, yet my face is there. But it targets for the movement. It prioritizes movement rather than, uh, than my eyes. Mm. But I do think there's something special about eyes. I'm inclined to think that there's something mm. about the surface of the eye itself, mm. probably its reflective nature that, that the cobras are seeing and reacting to. People for a long time seem to have recognized the snake is spitting at their eyes and they think it's reflective mm. because there are tribes in Africa who wear a piece of glass on a chain ar ar around the neck that hangs mm. down to the stomach. Mm. And what they're trying to do there is, is deflect the, the snake's attention away. Mm. Possibly. I don't know. That'd be a cool experiment. What if we could have done, done it? You get a mannequin or something and put pieces on it. I mean, we can, we can cut out eyes, yeah. we can put on mirrors, things like this, and just have, have the snake spit at these well, different scenarios. So that's it then, the mannequin test. And that'll do nicely. Perhaps they're just curious about our experiment, but at a waterhole only 50 yards away, we're joined by a family group of 11 elephants. Go back in for a drink. Mm. 
wouldn't take him long to cover that distance between him and us. You'd be too happy of going down the embankment here. Oh, they're very good at going down the embankments. They're very nervous of him. Coming down? Yeah. Yeah, he's coming. They can get down yeah. the bank. When elephants ask you to move, you move. Our field experiment could shed some light on the debate. Is the spitter attracted to eye shine, eye shape, or movement? This is pin the eye on the dummy, not pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> yeah. We cover the mannequin's own eyes with felt yes. eyes to eliminate any possible reflections. That's perfect. That's okay. going to work. Yeah. All right. Snakes next, then. All right. I've got uh, quite a, a big one here. Um, just have a look. He's hissing. Mm. Spreading hood. He's hooding. Good, good. And good tangle here. Doing this tangle. Let's just get him in a nice position. That's a very odd position for a daisy. Now. All right, just hang on a second. Right, I'm going to duck down here to minimize yeah, so the movement. Not where... Right, OK, you, you can move in. OK. I'm going to come in with the... It's perfect. Move the dummy. He sees it. He he's sees seen it. seen it. Yeah, he's looking at it. You'll have to oh, tell okay, me. OK, he's done it. He spat. He spat. All right. Where did he spit? I'm not sure. We'll have to check that. Mark, you know what I could see? Um, mm. As you approached it, the snake lifted its head up. As you got closer, slightly higher, and then spat. And it seemed to me higher up on the dummy's face. Yeah, if you look at this angle, Mark, you can see the venom. It's on the cheek. You got it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah across there. There is some up, up there. There's venom there. I can taste it very definitely. The snake definitely spat at the eyes. Just to confuse it, we put the eyes on the mannequin's back. And, no, still backing off, spreading a hood and then backing off, Mark. OK. Looking at it and spat. Did he? Yes. And I, think it was, I think it's straight at the eyes. Here. Yeah. And there. So that would suggest that he's actually targeting the eyes. The snake has still targeted the eyes. So now we give it a straight choice. The felt eyes on the chest or reflective mirrors on the mannequin's head. Which will it choose? Okay. The feisty one, eh? There we go. Oh, there. He's spit. Did he? Yeah. He's turning. Ah, oh, spitting at me. I'm going to get the... Yeah. Eyes. Nothing on the actual head of the mannequin or on the spoons. It's all here. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Jet, jet, jet. And, the, and he picked that and, and spat at it. Yes. I spoke a lot about movement, and it most certainly is a combination of movement and, and the eyes. Brief though this experiment's been, it would suggest that the spinning cat was aiming for the actual eye shapes, regardless of where they are. That seems to be the target. This wasn't a controlled experiment, but even so, these are intriguing results. Bruce's work is also nearing completion. Then we get an unexpected chance to add to his collection of spitters. How far? He says about four k's up on the on the car road. That's not so far. it's about six or seven k's from here. Let's go. This guy that phoned, he saw go under the rock. And, um, he, and he's, he's watching it. He's standing there he watching said, it. Good. He said, "Bring a crowbar, just in case." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you, Marco Shake. He's under that rock, is he? We can lift that one. Let me just get uh, some goggles on. Now let's clear some of the grass first. Yep, I can see it. I think it is exactly what we want. I yeah. think so, By man. The glint of its belly. Okay, easy. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. it grab? See if you can work it out there. Where you got me? And again. Ah, done down. Oh, dear. There he is. Got him, got him. Ah. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, he's chucking it about. <laughs> Damn it. I got him, I got him. Oh, he's... Uh, look at that. Look, let's get the cobra out on the path. That's a big one. <laughs> nice one, nice one. Um, um. Now, I'm arguing with you, you again. The venom tastes ferrous. No. It is no, tastes it. like... It's bitter. <laughs> it's ferrous. It tastes like... Will you pack that in? Yes, Mark. It has spitted me, yeah. All right. I've got venom all over me. <sighs> Ah. <laughs> it tastes like iron. They're <laughs> chewing nails. But I can taste it. It's, it's bitter, Mark. Yep, there's nothing wrong with your palate. <laughs> it tastes like iron. <laughs> there you go, that's a beautiful spitter. Just look at that, sort of pearly iridescence really? under the belly and the black bands. Ah. Beautiful Mozambique spitting cobra. That's a good size. That's exactly what Bruce needs. Hmm. He's going to be a happy boy. Right. 
It is ferrous. It's just like... It is bitter, Mark. Mm. Ferrous. Iron. Ah. It tastes like iron. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's one less to bite your stock, I think, at the moment. <laughs> Uh, one girl that worked for us, she had a small baby boy, about three, four years old. And that night he woke up and uh, he was crying and he had a, a sort of a purple swelling on his uh, uh, shoulder. And, uh, you know, we, we got a bit of a fright about this kid because he was moaning like hell and so we took him off to the doctor. Well, about four or five hours after that he died. But we got back there and we turned up that whole building, the, the floor, and we got one, I'll tell you what, about three times the size of that one. Really? If you had, and, uh, but a big bugger. But uh, why does it bite a, a child at night? Pe people are often bitten when they're sleeping by, by snakes, especially if they're sleeping on the ground. Yeah. I like my snakes, but um, I don't like them killing people. That's what Bruce's research is all about. Although it's in its early stages, his work with spitting cobras could one day improve the treatment of people bitten by venomous snakes. <laughs> Bruce has transferred the digital photographs of the venom patterns to his computer program. From their density and size, he calculates the volume of venom spat. When we do that, for each cobra, we can actually determine the consistency of the spitting behavior. When snakes bite, they inject amounts of venom that vary by up to 200 times. But Bruce discovers that when cobras spit venom, the volume is remarkably consistent. His groundbreaking conclusion is that the variation is down to the biting itself. Bruce's research program has only just begun, but we're on the road to understanding what exactly happens when snakes bite their victims. And if it saves a single life, it will all have been worth it. Bye-bye.